Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is really my pleasure and honor to be here with you ladies. Is it true that each of you have a th GPA of at least 3.0? All right, well, we're going to give y'all a very, 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 very big hand. Congratulations. All of those data that Laura cited are so hugely important. They tell us the story of Title IX. You saw those amazing images that Phyllis shared. Thank you, Phyllis. That was a good reminder to all of us that not so long ago, rampant stereotypes defined what you could do, what I could do, what people that looked like us could do. Opportunities weren't available, access was barred. Events like this just didn't happen. Sometimes we take these things for granted. I know that each of you is a champion and we are all here to celebrate your success today and congratulate you and get inspired by you and all the great things that you will do. So if you haven't given yourselves a very, very, very big round of applause for being here tonight, please do so now. These are my tactics because I know y'all are tired. I know y'all are tired. I know it's been a long, long, long day. I too want to thank Sankofa Project. I want to thank Janice Duff Johnson for inviting me. Uh, I want to thank each of you for wanting to listen a little bit. I want to thank Laura and the great work of the National Women's Law Centers. It's groups like that that continue to push us to do the right thing. As Laura said, my office at the Office for Civil Rights is responsible for enforcing that great law, that Title IX, that so many of you, I, I get dated in rooms like this because uh, I'm sure that the super, super majority of us weren't even thought of. Uh, in 1972 when the law was passed, unlike uh, those in, in the room that grew up just understanding its consequences and its opportunities. It gave me the opportunity to play soccer, right wing, uh, in, in a way where neighborhood sports were just happening for girls. They weren't available. I grew up right over here in Prince George's County. How many of you are from Maryland? Any of you in the room? All right, what part? Fiji, everybody from Fiji. Well, I've been in California for 20 years, right? So I came back and I said, all right. And y'all are number one and number two. Am I right on that? Yeah. All right. Uh, so when I got back, I said I was from PG County and they looked at me like, you're not supposed to say PG County anymore. Now you're supposed to say Prince George's County because all the other counties have these two names and apparently PG County. What school are you all at? Let's say that again. Seton, all right, I went to Largo High School, all right? Largo High School, I usually get that response when I see most people when I say I went to Largo High School. I'd like to say that it provided me a better opportunity than it does for so many coming through those halls in the last several years, but it didn't. Because my high school, like so many of yours and so many of your colleagues around the country, didn't provide me some real opportunities, those things like access to college preparatory curricula, those things like access to AP. I actually got AP, but it wasn't until I got to Spelman that I actually realized that I had to take the test in order to get credit. And it was the, you know, after, after the first semester, you sit down with your advisors, and I kept saying, well, why do I need to take biology? I had AP biology. See, I got to, though, take, I got to uh, be a teacher's aide the day that they were taking the test. Right? And I thought it was a good thing until I realized that without taking that test, the fact that I had an AP class didn't mean very much. It's just another class, right? It's what the last president called the soft bigotry of low expectations. The truth is, it's not so soft. And so many of us have been hobbled by that thing called the achievement gap, as Laura talked about my last job. It was something that we fought hard to close. That's that gap that separates students of color from their peers and low-income students from their more wealthy peers. We see it everywhere across this country. At a time when by 2023, the majority of America's school children are going to be children of color. By 2050, the majority of America's adults are going to be adults of color. 
Yet in almost every grade level, in almost every subject, not just a few years worth of learning seventh grade students, by the end of high school, five years, five years worth of learning separate some students from others. Then we look at the athlete pool. And boy, if you want to go to all those places where they're doing the right thing for students that are soaring, that are getting the academic supports, that as Laura said, are graduating higher than their peers, that are getting better jobs, that are becoming amazing leaders, that are getting into trouble less, we just have to go and find groups of students that look like you. Like you in this room, you all are the role models because of the skills that you learn in your athletic environments, because of the tenacity and the drive and the commitment that each of you bring every day. You are shining examples of what could be with the right supports and the right talent and the right smarts. And I know it's tough. Some of you come a very long way away. We're, we're in California. Orange County, so it's a little down south. I spent some years in LA, but I'm more of a Bay Area girl, as it turned out. What's that? <laughs> Wait, I missed it. Was it, uh, I'm too old? Yes. I'm just too old? Okay. This is the thing, I have, I have a niece, and, and I, 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 sometimes you're just too old. That's just the truth. But speaking of my niece, my sister the other day, she said, you know, what do I, I wanna get her into, right? How do I, what's the best thing I could do? Is there one single thing I could do to make sure that she is on a path to learn those values that I want her to learn as a young adult? To learn those, that, that sort of code of conduct for living in this really, really hard world. To learn to set stretch goals and to accomplish them. To learn to work hard, to learn to care about herself to learn to take care of herself and her body, to learn to be loyal, to learn to be committed. And she's like, there's no one thing, right? There's no panacea, there's no magic pill. I said, no, there certainly is not. However, get her involved in sports and all the research shows that those things that you are striving to help her become as a young woman, she will be. She will be. So we have to make sure, though, that your peers and colleagues around the country get these same opportunities that you have. And as far as we've come since 1972, do you know in 1972, for every uh, student athlete, for every, there was a girl, there were 12, there were boys. 12, there were boys. The opportunities just weren't there. Title IX is only 36 words, 36 words. But it is by far one of the most effective and profound civil rights laws in American history. Despite all the controversy that followed from those 36 words when they were included in the Higher Education Amendments Act of 1972, Title IX remains one of the greatest civil rights accomplishments of the last 30 years. You are a beneficiaries of that. Now at the time, 1972, right, how could it be controversial? On its face, all Title IX says is you can't discriminate on the basis of sex in any education program. Any school that receives federal money, that's 15,000 school districts in the country, that's over 5,000 colleges and universities in the country, they can't discriminate on the basis of sex. And in 1972, even then, that sentiment seemed widely shared and accepted. But we know for sure as we look back over the last 30 years since Title IX's passage that we, are, we have witnessed strides in, for girls and women that we never would have had opportunities to do. And it's not just sports, it's all of those data that Laura cited get into college at higher rates do better in math, science, technology, engineering courses. When given the opportunity, we soar. In fact, nowhere in Title IX, as President Obama recently noted, does it say sports, right? Yet Title IX is really seen by so many as only about sports. 
Our job is to use the power and the force of these laws to create equal opportunity everywhere where there's still a shortfall. And despite all the progress, I could go on and on and on about that data, happy to share it with you. But despite all the progress, women still don't have equal opportunity across the country. In far too many places where we go and investigate, we see the girls don't have access to the same facilities or good facilities. They don't get the same resources spent on them. They don't get the same training. They don't get the same medical facilities. They don't get the same coaches. They don't get the same academic tutoring. They don't get the same opportunities to play. Even if they're interested and able, participation rates in far too many places remain hugely unequal and inequitable. And let's not mention booster clubs. Okay? We have a very, very, very long way to go. When I was privileged to get confirmed by the Senate and began sitting on this perch, so many groups, Laura's among them, Laura and I are friends, and Laura pushes, let me tell you. We just met with them last week. Laura pushes. <laughs> Every time the National Women's Law Center comes in the building, I brace for impact. <laughs> but it's important. It's important to be pushed. It's important to push your policymakers, your, your government, to do what's right and to enforce these long-standing laws. When I first got the privilege to sit on this perch, Laura and so many others said things like, there's been a great slippage in Title IX. Look what's happened. We came so far in, from 1972 to 1980, then we started slipping. Then we picked back up in the early 90s, and then by 2000, we started slipping badly. We, we started slipping badly. And I made a commitment to one of Laura's colleagues, Marsha Greenberger of the National Women's Law Center, and I said, I promise you no more slippage. Not while Barack Obama is the President of the United States. And not while Arnie Duncan is the Secretary of Education. And not while Ruslan Alley is the Assistant Secretary of Education. But we need your help. We need your eyes. We need your ears. We need your passion. We need your examples. Because there are a lot of folks out there that don't think we need these laws that don't think we need more money, more money. Women, they say the gender gap is closing in so many places. So we don't need to give those opportunities anymore, right? We know what so many work so hard to do can get taken away in an instant if we don't keep pushing and fighting together. So I applaud you. I look forward to working with you. I can't wait to see you again and to follow your amazing careers. And if you ever out there feel like it's too tough, you'd be sure, apparently everything I do is on the website these days, so <laughs> you'd be sure to call us, right? And call me, because we and I are here to help. Thank you for your time tonight.